be as easy for Uh, does he plan to have any kind of uh, of energy? Talking about Mrs. Johnson's uh, staff, and uh, you know, Mrs. Johnson, I think, always appreciated uh, the extra time and effort that uh, her staff was putting in, no matter what the project. And she wanted to make certain that life could be as easy for them as possible. But I remember one day, she called me up, and I went up to see some damage that had been sustained by those porcelain birds again, those Dorothy Dowdy birds. And she said, I'd like to see if you could get them repaired. And I said, oh, I can do that right away. Well, maybe not today, Mrs. Johnson, maybe not until tomorrow, because I didn't uh, bring the car today. And she said, oh, you don't need, uh, uh, you just call. You Don't you have uh, uh, White House car privileges? And I said, well, we did until yesterday. But I said, Mr. Watson has decided that we're no longer on the list to be able to call and have a car immediately. And uh, so as a result of this, I'll, I'll have to make other arrangements. Oh, she said, never mind. Just take my car. That's perfectly all right. I'm not going anywhere for a while, and if anybody in Marvin's office raises any questions about it, I asked you to take my car. So I said, well, that's fine. And so took her car, and we went up to Mario's, which was located here on DuPont Circle, and we went through all the things. By the time I got back, there was a call to call Marvin who said there must have been some misunderstanding that there was no reason at all why we should have been demoted to the C list and that we would certainly henceforth be very much back where we had been on A minus minus or whatever it was. But uh, I remember sharing that with, uh, with Ashton and, uh, and perhaps Bess afterwards and we all got a great, great chuckle because of course all of us uh, were dealing with a chancellor of the exchequer over there on certain occasions, really uh, the East Wing more than I was, because we had uh, our whole program was, didn't take a penny of tax dollars. Uh, even my salary was a donation from the White House Historical Association. And all of the monies that went into uh, the fine arts, uh, decorative arts programs at the White House came from either revenues from the sale of the first uh, series of guidebooks and then the Living White House, which was the book that uh, Mrs. Johnson was responsible for uh, originating. And I didn't have to, but on the few occasions that I did, I realized that we were up against somebody who was Hetty Green over there in the West Wing, looking at every single penny and making sure that they could be squeezed until that old buffalo squealed. And it, it happened to me on, on that occasion. Anyway, you, uh, again, with, uh, with her staff, you worked with them and you played with them as well. And uh, it was, uh, I, I don't know, we probably met each other coming and going sometimes as far as, but you, you never seem to uh, grow tired. Uh, it reminds me of once going to a party out in Bethesda when I first came to Washington in which everyone there was an officer with the Central Intelligence Agency or their spouse. And uh, nobody, talked about what anybody did. It was all this very strange world. Well, we had, the, I can see why they would get together socially, we had the freedom of not only talking about what we did, but of laughing about each other's mistakes. And uh, while nobody else was overhearing this, it certainly was a great catharsis. No two ways. Uh, if you were involved in the, uh, in the, in the uh, shattering of the plates episode, mm. yeah. Uh, tell her from your point of view. Bess has already told her. Yeah, she told her. Well, she, she, she probably mentioned there's a law in the books that said that White House tableware has to be destroyed. And this goes way back. To, it's, a, it's a law that originated in the 19th century. Apparently, there used to be visitors at those New Year's receptions who were carrying off the plate and so forth. And the problem was that as breakage would occur in a state service, the entire state service would be withdrawn and would be disposed of, usually dumped in the Potomac River. Uh, we have any number of pieces today at the White House which came out of 20th century dredging of the Potomac River. Well, w this was built into the contract with Castleton and Tiffany when Mrs. Johnson's uh, service was uh, being ordered. There were approximately 220 place settings of which the dessert service would be 
all 50 states represented with a state flower. I remember when we first started talking about it. First, somebody mentioned state trees, and we finally, somebody threw out state dogs only in jest, believe me, but at that point I wasn't quite so sure. Maybe there was some, some uh, seriousness to that. And finally with state flowers, because Mrs. Johnson had very much set upon doing a wildflower on the on the base uh, plate and then the dinner plate the uh, would have an eagle from the Monroe service uh, on the center but it would all be very much out of the same palette and of the same uh, design process well a young French designer by the name of Andre Pietra those French were back to get us obviously did the dessert service he'd worked on the other and he came up with what we saw in drawing form to be quite reasonable and very pleasant. I mean, what can you do with yucca? Uh, you can do good things with blue bonnets, I suppose. You can do good things with violets, a little harder with magnolias, but on and on. But when you've got all 50 states, and that was what we were going to do. We were going to have the District of Columbia, all 50 states, and somehow we'd have extra from Texas and maybe from Minnesota, I'm not sure, but we were going to get up to 220, but the basic 50, 50, 50, 50 plus those extra 20 would be filled in. And when the desserts, the china came down, the bowls were magnificent. You've seen the pieces at the library. Uh, wonderful until we saw the dessert plates and it looked like something that even F.W. Woolworth or Neisner would not be able to unload on the consuming public. I mean, no two ways about it. So Walter Hoving, who was then chairman of the board of Tiffany and Company, came down and we lined the dessert service up in our office and he came in. We'd already done the final showing of the Peter Hurd in our office, so we now had something else to, to share and he said, this is just not Tiffany. It absolutely isn't Tiffany at all and we'll begin again, which they did. And we got the Library of Congress and a botanist from the library science and technology staff involved and we went through it and we saw every last uh, decal, uh, decal coming is the process, so every decal has to be uh, printed and when they're fired at 200 and, or 2,200 degrees or thereabouts, sometimes the colors tend to change uh, more than slightly. So all this has to be factored in. So we went through all of it and it took forever. I think the dessert service was finally uh, delivered uh, in the second year of the Nixon administration. I think I was still there uh, when that came in. But anyway, we were left with 220 dessert plates that we had to destroy. And so, Best said, I know how I want to destroy them. They're not going to go in the Potomac and they're not going to be broken up by some park service uh, machine that, uh, that is brought front and center. And so we took a room that we had down in the basement where we had cataloged Linda and Lucy's wedding presents and Bess arrived with this giant poster which had not only bullseye but names and I think little sketches of certain individuals over in the West Wing. And J.B. West, Connie Carter, who was the botanist, uh, the librarian from the Library of Congress, who was involved with the news service, I think Carol Carlisle, yours truly, and Bess, like Admiral Dewey, said, fire away! And she hurled the first plate which literally, I think, tore into poor Marvin, but I'm not sure about that. And on and on and on and on we went. And by the time we were through, 220 plates were lying in rubble on the floor. And in, I mean, it was just, it was penance for me to have to be a part of that. I agonized because I could see these examples, no matter how awful they were, they still had a story to tell. And I had not, I'd been very honest and above board, I had not taken one of each out and hidden them someplace. Uh, not, not in the least, but it was, uh, it was the way that uh, the law was uh, upheld and Devere Pearson, who, whoever was looking over our shoulder in the uh, West Wing as far as our uh, contractual obligations were concerned, uh, I suppose was satisfied, but I was, I was not. Uh, yes, certainly you could venture spleen in wonderful ways, but I didn't really have that much uh, against anybody over there, so I really could not uh, perhaps feel the full brunt of it uh, as, as maybe uh, best did, but that's, that's my recollection of that whole situation. What, uh, 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 
just to round this out, uh, well, I'm going to ask first of all, mm. at the end of this, go over anything you think that uh, that is in your memory and your mind that we haven't covered. But no, but I'd like to I'd like to have you reflect a little on uh, uh, on the career of Jim. How, how did uh, when did you how did it all begin and and uh, uh, and and, and, and uh, how many administrations were you worked for? Oh, I was there for, th for uh, Kennedy, Johnson, and into, I left uh, in the middle of the second year of the Nixon administration. Uh, dumb luck. Uh, there's no other way to describe it. Harry, I came down uh, fresh out of college uh, as uh, an enrolling law student at Georgetown. I had, a, uh, I had to make up my mind between Stanford on the West Coast and, and Georgetown here. And I came down, well, got a job with the Park Service. I was a counterfeit Confederate, as you may recall, with General Lee over at Arlington House. And in uh, 1961, uh, the program began at the White House and Mrs. Kennedy turned to the Park Service for staff in the curator's office. And I went over to uh, it would have been perhaps late spring or so to uh, uh, I uh, had an application in for uh, a job I was sent over actually by a personnel person in uh, interior a national capital region they had uh, a registrar's spot that had opened up or, or was being created and I went over and did not get the job and about two weeks later got called back for a supporting job uh, to uh, the, the curator's position and went over and that job uh, I got. But by the time they'd finished with uh, full field security and so forth, we're talking about the, uh, we're getting on into 61, into the, uh, the fall of the year. So I started, my first job was dealing with all the correspondence that came in from a Life magazine cover story that they did in early September of 61 of Mrs. Kennedy. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy, a picture that Nina Lean took of her out on the Truman balcony uh, and inside it just a, a uh, series of, of uh, black and white shots showing her everything from moving mirrors to you name it. And then uh, as we continued on, we started to get ready for what CBS was going to be doing the following winter. Uh, actually, the show was taped in late January of 62, and it was shown on Valentine's Day. And then the following weekend, all three networks. Uh, originally, it was on CBS. Perry Wolf was the producer. So I'm working with two other people. Uh, in a relatively small operation that suddenly is uh, catching on like wildfire as far as the American public is concerned. And so I had, uh, after my first year of law school, I had decided that I was going to take a year off and see what was happening. This is what, when I was going to the White House. And I Finally, because my, my time usually was about 8 o'clock at night by the time I was through, and my, my uh, law school hours were anywhere from about 6 o'clock, it seems to me, to about 9 o'clock in the evening. Uh, by the time I had spent a year at the White House, I said, the heck with it. I'm going to go on and uh, do graduate work in art history and with a concentration on American uh, painting at uh, GW, which was just down the street. And if I could work off some independent projects, uh, independent study projects, I would, would do that. And that's really what I did. Like the man who came to dinner uh, from 61 through uh, 70, uh, there I was. In the summer of 1963, we'd had, the, the curator was having a second child and she retired. And Bill Elder, who had been registrar, moved up into her situation. And in the summer of 63, he was offered the top job at the Baltimore Museum. And he was a native of Baltimore, and that was really something that he very much wanted to do. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy was up at the Cape that summer expecting uh, Patrick and uh, she asked if I would hold down the fort until after the baby was born and she came back and I said sure and when she came back she said 
I really would like you to try this. And I said, well, Mrs. Kennedy, I really don't think I'm the person for the job. There are too many other people out there whose qualifications are eminently better. And she said, yes, but you've been here and you know, we know you, you know us type of thing. And I said, I'm too young. And she said, don't worry about that. We can take care of that. And I didn't really understand what she meant until the press release that came out announcing that I had taken the the uh, curatorial spot and instead of being 24 years old I was now 29 years old and I sent a copy of the press release to my parents knowing that this would delight them to no end that they had not been married at the time of my birth and uh, that this took care of all kinds of questions as far as who shook the family tree I remember Dorothy McArdle I was up in New York State with Barbara uh, visiting uh, our families when the announcement came out and she somehow tracked me down up there and she's reading the release to me saying is this true is this true is this true and she got to the age thing and I gulped three times and said yeah that's fine go on and I ran on I thought you know for somebody who was going to have to go to confession on Saturday three different ways to, to confess this one I'm not quite sure how it's going to come across but that's how it started and uh, we did certainly seem to get things done and when Mrs. Johnson arrived I mean I really give her credit more than any other individual and for the president's backing for making this whole program as we have know it today and it still relies very much on the private uh, funding that it gets from the proceeds of the books and so forth. It, she as the responsible party it would have been so easy for her to say look it's over I don't want to even try to compete uh, on that plane whatsoever but instead she from beginning to end got herself involved in every single uh, meeting of the Committee for the Preservation of the White House. As President Johnson uh, issued the executive order in March uh, of, of 1964, doing two things, setting up a permanent uh, group to oversee the White House collections and their preservation, and also to make the Office of Curator a permanent part of, uh, of the White House. Up until then, it was a, started out as kind of a Smithsonian uh, stepchild, and it went through all kinds of, of, of changes. The first curator had to report both to the Smithsonian every week and also uh, to Mrs. Kennedy when, whenever, and he straightened that out beautifully, and uh, it really meant that once you had the second act, namely what, what Mrs. Jay was doing, and then she said, where are our needs? And for the first time had a very developed sense of, of finding representations by American painters who until then had not seen the White House. And I'm thinking of people like Winslow Homer and Thomas Aikens and, and Thomas Sully and on and on and on the list continued and any number of portraits of, of presidents and their spouses. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, for example, Mrs. Truman and uh, the uh, Shumatov uh, copy of FDR that Shumatov was painting at the time of his of his death. Uh, I mean, the wonderful uh, example of all this is I went through what must be about the 18th edition of the White House guidebook recently, and I looked at everything that was being featured, and of course they're only going to let surface what they think are the best and the most historic of the pieces that have been acquired, and the majority of the pieces that were there came during the Johnson administration that were being featured. And I thought, if anything is a true test, and I mean, this is a book that is being edited by people who don't even remember uh, these kids uh, when Lyndon Johnson was, was in the White House. So it, there are all kinds of, of uh, things about the program that I was associated with that I can only uh, tip my hat and say thank you so much for the time, effort, and interest that was shown from the very beginning. Does that program endure today? It sure does. Extremely successful. Continues, and I think uh, so much so that it will endure 50 years from now, and uh, and hopefully as long as uh, the president's living in the White House. That may change. He may find himself in a bunker down the Potomac someplace, but what we is shall your see. What with with the program? Uh, I do, well, I'll work on. Uh, special projects from time to time, but uh, really just more keeping in touch with them. They still have questions about things that uh, happened back uh, during, uh, during my watch. Uh, I try uh, to make 
myself available both to this program and the program up on, on the Hill, uh, working, for example, with uh, uh, portrait commissions and things of, of that type where we're, you're looking at various uh, painters. The White House Historical Association has done an awfully good job in making certain that the money is there for the important commissions, such as presidential and and uh, and first lady, but uh, you know, so much of what has gone on has far surpassed, I think, anything that we could have imagined even during uh, during my time. The uh, the development, uh, the publications, the uh, the historical society has started to live up to its name uh, in many more ways than it, it could in the very beginning when it was really a vehicle for uh, funding more than anything else and to be able to copyright materials that uh, otherwise would have been in the public uh, domain. Did your, uh, uh, what, a name that has not come up yet, <coughs> Nash Castro. Did hmm. you have a go we did. Yeah, yeah. He was, of course, the liaison between uh, the White House and the Park Service, uh, right on up uh, through. Let's see. Nash finished out with the Johnson administration, but he certainly was gone uh, early in the Nixon administration. He may have even left in the last months of the Johnson administration. I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure, but we certainly did work very the closely together. Leaving. My leaving, well, there are a couple of things. Uh, one, I realized the writing was on the wall. I was having going round and round with Haldeman on money that was being spent for social, uh, basically, uh, busloads of ladies from uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, who were part of the Grand Rapids Republican Women's Group, were coming to the White House and they were being entertained and Haldeman felt it was only appropriate that since they were seeing the White House collection that the monies which have been set aside for conservation and preservation funds could go to the entertainment side and I was not uh, able to sign off on this and I knew after going around with him a couple of times on this that, that uh, my life expectancy was not going to be that great. I also think I was probably too closely tied to, to Democratic ad administrations, there's no doubt about it. So after a year and a half of this I had been oh gosh, approached twice before uh, by Mansfield to uh, work on setting up a program on the Hill. And I knew that as our kids started coming along that I would love to be able to get home at a, at a decent hour. I mean, there were times, for example, in the Johnson administration when we would do these receptions for members of the Senate and members of the House two a week, Tuesdays and Thursday nights, that would begin with uh, my telling anecdotes to the wives down in the theater, present up in the East Room with Bundy and Rusk and McNamara, and then we'd take the wives up on the elevator and we'd go up to the second floor and tour the family quarters. I remember a horrible experience that happened, best may have told you about this when the Conleys who came all the time he often came by himself but she was often along as well and they always uh, were assigned to the Lincoln bedroom and J.B. West and Mary Kaltman and Bess and I were kind of in the advance guard of Mrs. Johnson's tour and we would also break up and and spend time each of us would station ourselves in the room so as the, the spouses would come in and out and we happened to check the Lincoln bedroom and my god the clothes were laid out and it was obvious that somebody was there and we looked and we discovered it was the Conleys and nobody the usher's office apparently had not known or JB had not known about it at that point and uh, so we quickly closed the door to the Lincoln bedroom and I remember uh, Mary Kaltman shoving some things in the closet we made the bed I was on one side and Bess was on the other uh, everything that we could whisked away, things went into the dresser drawers uh, and the bathroom door was closed and so forth. And just as we finished, we're all standing around the bed, Mrs. Johnson throws open the door and looks and sees four of us, two men and two women, standing by the Lincoln bed. And I mean, there was certainly a very strange, at least it seemed to me, a very strange look on her face, but we just nodded and said, just making sure everything's fine, ma'am, and in they came. And I thought, you know, what was the film, Bob and Alice, Ted and somebody? Well, here we were. Only it was Lincoln Bedroom one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Harry, what was your question? I'm sorry. 
<coughs> about, <coughs> about the departure. Oh, the depart my departure, right. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I do feel that uh, I had probably uh, uh, pushed my luck about as far as it would go. So anyway, I asked uh, a, a mutual friend of Mansfield's and, and uh, mine if indeed that program on the Hill was still going forward. Meantime, uh, I had had a couple of conversations with George Hartzog. And George had just the perfect uh, idea. We need somebody to go up to Thomas Edison's uh, studio in the Oranges, who uh, the, the uh, world of, of, of uh, every invention in the world, and, and pull it all together. Apparently, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of things that had never been cataloged and everything else. And this, uh, for somebody who barely Barely uh, got through high school physics. This was not going to be my my day uh, in the sun. And I, the more I thought of it, the more I realized that I wanted to certainly stay where I was in D.C. if I possibly could. And I would like to do something that would allow me to be home maybe at seven o'clock in the evening. And Mansfield very kindly uh, said, "Sure, we still are looking for somebody. And uh, if you." will come up, so I went up and spent the next 25 years on the Hill, and again, never should probably have been paid for any of this, because it was just, uh, the pleasures were amazing, and it's true. I mean, granted, you had your, I remember taking uh, a very sullen Eartha Kitt, this was before she ever appeared at the Women's Doers Luncheon through, and a, a Zsa, Zsa Gabor who, I spent two hours with her, and three days later, when she went on Johnny Carson and described it, it was as if it was a totally different world. Uh, not only did she w not see the president with me, the president wasn't even in town, but on Carson's show, it was the President of the United States who took her around. I've been confused for Willard Scott, but never for Lyndon Johnson. Uh, so there were always these little side things that were happening in your life that you kind of shook your head and said, stranger than fiction. But all in all, when it comes right down to it, you don't miss uh, what it does to your schedule, but you sure as hell miss the people that you've been dealing with, and I, especially uh, the Johnson uh, folks. But since they had departed scene, and I really hadn't uh, tried to get to know uh, the Nixon people uh, in, in any great shape or means, I mean, we pretty much uh, stayed and tended to our, uh, our knitting. I found uh, that it was, uh, it was probably all for the best that I was going to see the writing on the wall. I've told you that story of going to the Nixon White House uh, Sunday service, and I won't go into this right now, but you remember the, the, the tale about Barbara being pregnant with Sarah and the Nixons inviting the folks to, well, Nixon, it was the war and he did not want to go out into St. John's or any Sunday services because the protesters were gathering around the doors of the churches. And so he decided that he would hold a 10 o'clock service every Sunday in the East Room of the White House. And then people would uh, gather uh, in the state dining room for some juices and, and sweet rolls and so forth and so on. So on a particular Sunday in July, the memo had come around. They'd gone through cabinet and sub-cabinet, and they were now getting into White House staff uh, to uh, invite uh, me and my wife and any children that we had uh, to go uh, to, to be present and accounted for on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And Barbara was about, oh, three or four or five months, uh, four months, I guess, along with Sarah at that point. And John was all of about three and a half years old. And when you work in the White House and you have a three and a half year old, you don't really stress for them uh, doing a little bit of, of uh, Mother Goose or poetry, but rather they seem to pick up on other things. For example, John was in the White House enough to go around and see every presidential portrait. And when he would see them, he would imitate them. So he had a Lincoln, and he had a Washington pose, and he had all poses, but he didn't have a Nixon pose because a Nixon portrait was not hanging in the White House. But he had a February 1969 cover of Life magazine. Nixon's first trip, you may remember, abroad was to Romania. And in the back of the old Queen Mary, uh, the Secret Service car was Nixon, hands up, throwing his head back in the V for victory. And this was what uh, John had in his collection at home, along with the, uh, the book that the White House Historical Association put out on the presidential portraits. So that was his Nixon pose. Anyway, 
we went through the service, which was about 45 minutes, uh, in the uh, East Room, and Barbara was a little uncomfortable, but John seemed very happy looking at the Gilbert Stewart of Washington that was hanging over on the wall. And when we finished, we went down the cross hall, the, the long corridor connecting the state dining room with the East Room. We went into the state dining room, and President and Mrs. Nixon were standing in front of the Lincoln, the Healy portrait of Lincoln, receiving the folks who had just gotten God in the, in the uh, East Room. And we went through the line, and we're approaching the line, and as you may recall, in those days, the male preceded the, the wife, and Barbara had John by the hand, and as we got just about to where I am now in relationship to you, uh, you being Richard Milhouse Nixon, Barbara let go of John's hand for a moment and he came, stood out and looked at the portrait of Abraham Lincoln and kind of went into his Lincoln pose and then he looked up at Richard Nixon and at that point he threw both arms up in the air, rolled back his eyes having seen Rich Little on television and did a complete pirouette right in front of Nixon with every aide in the world ready to pounce and everyone looking. In fact, the aide who got to him first took his hand, gave it back to Barbara, who was absolutely so undone that it's a wonder she didn't have Sarah right there in the state dining room. We made the most amazing exit going through the line saying thank you, no thank you, and so forth, and getting out of the White House so quickly that I shook all the way home and the next day delivered to every single office in the White House was the fact that if children are under age 12 they would not be expected nor would they be uh, invited to any services in the White House uh, Sunday service henceforth. We killed it for them once and for all. It's a wonder that I lasted another year or whatever uh, from that, but in any event, uh, that, was, uh, that was my uh, memory of, of uh, Nixon and Nixon uh, the staffers we have known. My favorite memo of H.R. Haldeman was when, and he'd, he loved to send memos to the staff all the time, but it was, uh, next Tuesday, the Brunswick bowling ball man will be here to fit Tricia and Mrs. Nixon for new balls. Please be uh, aware of the fact that the bowling ball, the bowling alley will not be open at that point. And believe me, the Xerox machine that was down in the East Wing, it was the only one we had at that time, burned out that day. I can imagine it did. Mm. <coughs> Jim, is there anything that we haven't covered? That, uh, oh, uh, probably about five years worth. And I apologize for going down, again, talk about going down uh, highways and byways that are off the beaten path. But no, Harry, you really, uh, you, you make it uh, a pleasure. And you've gotten me to think about things things that I haven't really considered well, I mean, in a long, long time. Your, uh, your reminiscences are, 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 are going to be important, and, I, I, and I'm, I'm very glad that we have this on, oh. uh, on, on tape now, but uh, I didn't, before we, I, I'm loath to, to, to quit. If there is anything running around through your brain that... Uh, that that's oh, right. gosh. Uh, not, I mean, there's sure there's a lot, but there's nothing that I, I, I think I've we've probably touched upon uh, as many uh, of the uh, the aspects of, of life in the Johnson White House. It was not, like no other. I mean, as someone who considers himself a student of White House social history and how uh, earlier administrations uh, existed under that roof line, I, I don't think that anything uh, ever existed that was even close to, to what I saw during that, uh, during that five-year period. Absolutely not. All right, that's a great place to stop. Okay.